best. So that's at 515 today. Uh, we will uh, we'll take this to the top of the hour here. But uh, some interesting quotes uh, came out of George Klyav- Klyavkov. I don't even know. I don't even know how he has his name. Klyavkov. I don't think he knows. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jack. By the way, Jack, did you see that email from David K? Okay, good deal. Just want to make sure you saw it and you weren't driving. Uh, he, uh, he has said, look, the opportunity to revisit uh, expansion following Texas circuit Oklahoma certainly presented itself. I am not actively poaching any school or convincing anyone to leave their existing conference, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't listening to schools that wanted to go to the Pac-12, and we've had a lot of them reach out. Probably all the ones you'd expect and several you'd be surprised by. All right. So again, if the Big 12 is left out of this, this doesn't mean that these schools can't jump out of the Big 12 eventually and jump into another league. It just, to me, I think... I think with the news today, especially when you hear quotes like that and like their announcements on expansion could come soon after that, even after meeting with Bob Bowlesby. I mean, like, look, Bob Bowlesby could be involved, like the maybe optimistically here. Here's what I'm thinking. Talk to me. Maybe Bob Bowlesby is not involved in all this because the Pac-12 and the Big 12 have a separate deal. And then when the scheduling alliance is announced, then shortly uh. after that, we'll find out that not only that, the Pac-12 is going to add... They're going to move east. Ace up the sleeve. Ace up the sleeve, so to speak. So maybe, like optimistically, I think that. Yeah. Now, realistically, I don't. But, sure. you know, or realistically, it might be the Pac-12 just goes, all right, here's the four that we want. And then, yeah, you know, that that we're willing to deal with and let's let's go with those four. Yeah. And then we're the Pac-16 and we're in a scheduling alliance and we've got the middle of the country, we've got the west coast of the country, and now with the alliance, you've got... The Big Ten, you've got the whole, you know, border to border covered. Yeah, and I mean, I think if we were to see something like that, like your most optimistic situation, Klievkov's from like MGM, like the MGM world of managing hotels and things, yeah. of that, things of that nature. So like if we were to see something unorthodox and just sort of wild and out there, he would be the guy to do it. And so it, it is sort of confusing to me too. Why is the Pac-12 sitting in this position of power to where they're now in this alliance with the Big Ten and the ACC? Like you would think if they were to do a ranking of appealing conferences, even with just the eight teams. I get USC is a pretty big chip to have if you're the Pac-12, but you would still think that the the Big 12 with eight teams would be somewhere competitive with the Pac-12. Like, I don't get why they're left out. I yeah. would think Bullsby's meeting wouldn't have gone well, I guess, at yeah. that point. All right, so he says, uh, Klyavkov says, we've taken initial meetings with everyone that has expressed an interest. We have a working group. We were together deciding on what to recommend. At the end of the day, they'll make the decision about whether or not to offer admission to the Pac-12 to any other schools. And according to the Athletic, the announcement between the Pac-12, Big Ten, ACC could come as soon as next week. And the Pac-12 decision could follow shortly after. So uh, we'll see. There's no hard deadline related to any of this. But I would say I don't think it's good for college athletics, given the vibration that's going on as a result of the Texas and Oklahoma news. The quicker we can dampen that vibration, the better. We will have a decision on whether we intend to expand or not in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, see, there you go. I mean, that like, again, nothing's going to happen super fast. Not certainly. And it feels like Texas and Oklahoma happened, Oklahoma happened fast. I feel like they're gone already. But for Texas and Oklahoma, it didn't happen fast. They worked on this for months in secret. It's just hit, it hit, it's hit everyone else. And I'm like, whoa, this came out of nowhere because that's what they wanted it to do. Yeah. And, you know, I often wonder, had the story not been leaked would yeah. we even like would have been report have they, would they have told anybody by now or they'd be navigating the legal waters a little bit more to say like okay we'll wait till after the end of this year and then we'll say it because then we you know you got to think because of the source that leaked it being associated with A&M you got to think it was kind of a not their plan at least you would think well, it would not it? have been and I don't think and, it was Texas and Oklahoma's plan at all oh no no to shot. have anybody know about it no and shot. I wonder if we'd even know now no, I don't think so. I think it would be like before it's too late. I think it already was too late, but I think it would have been, excuse me, after it's too late. Yeah. Would have I think, been their, their approach. But like, like, I think we would, we would be approaching the season now being like, all right, well, here's what's going to happen. And yeah. we would know Texas and Oklahoma and the SEC. And you all say this a couple months ago or a month and a half ago, we read an article that was from a Texas site from a guy saying like, Texas needs to be in a, in a power, like a better league. And the league is beneath Texas. And I thought like, man, this is some snooty texas fan right here that a league they haven't even come close to winning i guess close they they were in the big 12 championship a couple years ago but they haven't won in a long time and uh most years aren't even in the discussion to win it 
say for two in the last decade, you think the league's not doing enough for you? Like you haven't said like, maybe we're not doing enough for the league. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's the other thing about it. And then here they are leaving. You, you think know. it's going to get easier in the SEC? You think that's no, the solution? No, it's not going to get easier. No, I'm saying for them. If, that, if that's no. your approach, that's what you want to think about is yeah. going to the SEC not, and I saying it's like, going to be better for us. Yeah. It's better for you is to win games, win your conference. Yeah. You're not going to do that in the SEC for a long time, I would assume, unless something crazy happens and Sark's the man, which I think he will be, but I don't think it'll be the man that quickly in the SEC. But I mean, like, to win the SEC, like, you can be the man who wins at Texas, but you can be the man who wins at Texas in the SEC. Like, there are, like, look, just, just on eight, like, right now, for right now, a mm -hmm. is a better team than them. Yeah, a absolutely. has a look. No question. And um, Steve Sarkeesian, while he's got a couple pelts on the wall, he has not done it as a head coach what Jimbo Fisher's done as head coach. Mm -hmm. Jimbo Fisher, at least on paper and on by accomplishment, is a better, more accomplished coach than Steve Sarkeesian. 100%. So right now, just, just with AM, they're the second best team in, in Texas in the SEC. Yeah. Like now, history dictates that that switch has been flipped many a time, but. A and M's better now. A the SEC has worked out for them. They have a head like they have a head coach who knows what he's doing in that league. They have a head coach who's won a national title. A head coach who knows how to win a national title. A head coach who knows what it's like to build a team in the modern era of college football. Mm -hmm. They have all that stuff. They did not have that for for many many years, and now they do. And so they're ahead of the game. Now, how far ahead of the game they can say that Texas remains to be seen. The other problem is, like, they might be ahead of Texas. They're behind Oklahoma. Sure. So Oklahoma's still coming in. So you're going to have to play Oklahoma probably every year if you're A&M. They're behind them. So, again, the SEC can change just that fast. So if you're A&M, you got to feel like you really got to strike with the iron's hot. Uh, and it took them this long outside of the first year with Johnny Manziel, which was a miracle. Yeah, that was not going to happen. I, I, like, that, yeah. was not con that was not going to set up to be consistent. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, Texas is not going to do that in the SEC. No shot. You know, I mean, not right away. I mean, maybe eventually they will. Yeah. You would, I mean, you would hope so. They're, like, for the sake of the Big 12's optics, you would hope, okay, that they eventually become competitive, or at least Oklahoma's competitive right off the bat, and I think they will be. But, no, I mean, I think another thing that should be mentioned is Texas A&M has a head coach who knows how to manage a program. It doesn't have boosters putting his hand or putting their hands in his program every other hour of the day because that's a whole other job you have to deal with in Austin, which is really tough. College Station in Austin, Texas are just very different settings and that one's way more conducive to a winning football program than the other one is, right now at least. And so I think if you're Steve Sarkeesian, that's the first thing I'm talking about. If I'm, I mean, I want to be able to do my job and not have Joe Schmo with a million dollars telling me, what to run and all these different things and have his hand in my program. Yeah. Good luck. Like that, that it's not going to work in the sec. Yeah. That, yeah, that, it, yeah, that at Texas though is hard to do, you know, he's got to do. Yeah. So I mean, I mean Mac Brown wouldn't put up with it. Mac Brown was winning, but well, I mean, it, it wore Mac Brown down. I mean, it wore him down. Yeah. And then it, like part of it was that, uh, you know, and part of it was that, you know, I think it passed Mac by a little bit. I think they got a little lazy in the complaint, like, lazy, lazy and complacent. Like they, you know, they were kind of, Texas was not, they're not developing players. They also weren't getting players that fit what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They're just like, if you're the number one linebacker, we want you. Yeah. Well, do you, are you the number one linebacker in the defensive system we play? Or are you the number one linebacker in a different defensive system? Yeah. I think that, that kind of thing. And, and I think that that thing really hurt them. I think especially on the offensive and defensive lines, they're just grabbing guys who were like, well, this is the number one guy. Everybody wants him. Yeah, but is he best fit for you? Like, yeah. sometimes it's okay to let the number three defensive tackle go if he's never going to work in your program if the number 51 guy is perfect for what you do. Yeah, you look at Oregon during those times. I mean, when Mac Brown was head coach at Texas, they were tearing it up, and they were doing it with a bunch of three stars. Yeah. I mean, that's crucial, and that's kind of been the thing at Texas year in and year out. It's like, okay, we're going to get the highest ranked class we can, and we'll find a way to make it work. And that's but, not at all the way that yeah, they don't work on they don't X's and O's. They yeah. don't develop. No, you know, not like, develop. You know, like, what – you know, Matt Rule did was come here and develop players, into the NFL players. Yeah, you develop guys. You want coaches to develop. I think that's what Steve Sarkeesian will do. We'll talk more about this here coming up in the 5 o'clock hour at 5.15. Tim Buckley joins us to talk Louisiana. This is Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports.